Hey everyone, so recently I had the opportunity to check out Intel's brand new NUC, the new unit of computing. And what makes this one so special is that inside is the KB Lake G chipset, combining a quad-core i7 processor with a semi-custom Radeon Vega graphics core from AMD. Yes, it's a collaboration I never thought I'd see after all the bitter recriminations over the years and indeed the lawsuits. But here we are. Intel's providing their CPU expertise here, bringing in AMD for what is surely the most powerful integrated graphics we've ever seen. And it's all tied up in this neat little package, so let's quickly talk about that. Now you may have seen this style of premium, higher performance NUC before, and I've got to say that it's a really neat little package here. Now what immediately stands out, apart from the uh, rather bizarre and garish skull motif, well that would have to be the sheer range of I.O. you get here. Let's take a quick look at the front of the unit then. That'll be the power button on the left, followed by an SD card reader, two USB 3.0s, USB-C, HDMI 2.0, pretty impressive. But the rear is something else, with Toslink audio, power input, a brace of USB-Cs, twin mini display ports, dual LANs, four USB 3.0s, and yes, another HDMI 2.0 port. So clearly, hooking up stuff to this unit isn't gonna be a problem. And if anything, we're kind of over-engineered here in terms of connectivity. Two HDMI 2.0s? Well, presumably that allows for an easy hookup of a VR headset. So yeah, all of this in a tiny PC, well, that's pretty great, right? Well, yes it is, until you see the size of the power brick here. It's pretty huge compared to the main unit itself. Now, of course, you can tuck that away wherever you want, but as small as the NUC is, it's not the fully integrated unit that you may think it is. Okay, so this may well be the most powerful ultra small form factor machine on the market, and here's why. So, this is a look at the processor configuration inside the machine, the KB Lake G chipset itself. On the right there, pretty standard, 4-core, 8-thread i7, while next to it sits the bespoke AMD graphics core. And then on the far left is the HBM2 memory. It's all hooked up with what Intel calls its embedded multi-die interconnect bridge, allowing these discrete packages to sit together, tightly integrated. So there have been some comparisons between this and AMD's own APUs, which combine a quad-core Ryzen setup with their own Vega graphics implementation. But there are some profound differences here. First of all, AMD's solution is completely integrated, so everything is on one piece of silicon, so there's no need for any kind of external interconnect at all. Secondly, Intel's solution has HBM2 memory, meaning a massive, for this kind of configuration anyway, 205 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, dedicated entirely to the GPU, while the CPU sticks with normal system DDR4. On the Ryzen APU, yeah, everything is shared from that same system memory, meaning lots of contention between CPU and GPU. Now that's not ideal, but the key point of differentiation here is that AMD's APUs are budget, lower power parts, while KB Lake G is a premium option by comparison. But just how fast is it? Intel's own choice of benchmarks in the run-up to launch has been kind of weird. I've seen comparisons with GTX 1050 Ti and the Max-Q laptop version of the GTX 1060. I guess this is because the small package here means that KB Lake G is good for tiny PCs like the NUC and also gaming laptops. But how powerful is it? Well, there are different desktop and laptop configurations, and the NUC here is the best of the best. It has a 100 watt TDP. The i7 runs at 3.9 gigahertz across all cores, with single core boost to 4.2. And well, the GPU is top of the line. That means you get a full complement of 24 compute units running flat out at 1190 megahertz. Now, a while back on Eurogamer, I speculated that GTX 1050 Ti performance, or maybe slightly faster, was the likely level of throughput from this device. So just how close was I? Well, of course, it's gonna vary by the game, but let's begin with a quick look at Battlefield 1 on DX12, 1080p resolution, ultra settings, four distinct bands of performance here, with the Nux RX Vega MGH managing a 14% lead over the 1050 Ti. 
But yeah, 1060 and its Radeon equivalent RX 580, they're 33 and 48% ahead respectively. Bottom line though, I played this game locked at 1080p60 Ultra on the NUC and that's pretty amazing from my perspective for a machine this small. Ashes of the Singularity is another AMD favourite and again there are similar power bandings here. What I found interesting is that performance in dense scenes sees the NUX Vega graphics pull ahead of NVIDIA 1050 Ti more significantly than in simpler scenes, kind of distorting NVIDIA's average frame rate results upwards a tad. Regardless though, we're seeing a similar pattern overall. There's a similar banding of performance here in Assassin's Creed Unity, a game I like to throw in because I think legacy titles deserve testing too. This one's a firm workout. It's a fairly decent showing here for the RX Vega MGH, though interestingly the depth of field effect causes issues for both of the Radeon GPUs I'm testing here. This causes the delta between Nvidia and AMD to close up a touch, lowering the averages on the Radeon side in a way that you probably wouldn't see in gameplay, so yeah it's worth pointing out. I also wanted to highlight newcomer Assassin's Creed Origins actually. Now for some reason the new NUC really doesn't perform well on this game and by the end of the benchmark the 1050 Ti actually delivers a 5% lead. This is entirely at odds with pretty much every other test I did and I'm sort of curious what the issue could be. I doubt it's drivers as such because RX 580 seems to cope fine here. This one is heavy on CPU as well as GPU which may be a possible explanation. I'll need to look into this benchmark a little more closely. Meanwhile, here's a quick look at the division running on DX12. And yeah, again, it's all looking rather familiar. There's anything up to a 50% performance deficit between the RX Vega MGH graphics in the NUC and the RX 580. Though one thing I do want to point out is that AMD sent us the Sapphire Nitro version of the 580. It's got a pretty meaty factory overclock, which will boost its results a tad. But regardless, those distinct power bands, there they are again. We'll round off the standard performance tests with a look at The Witcher 3 here. Again, it's more like GTX 1050 Ti than anything else we're testing here, but this test hammers the CPU and indeed system memory bandwidth. And here's another thing, the NUC here only has 2400 MHz DDR4, so the beginning area of the bench, I kind of think it's more prone to stutter here because of that. I saw similar stuttering issues in Crisis 3 too, as you can see here. I mean, by and large, it's still faster than GTX 1050 Ti. 12% faster overall, but maybe background streaming is hitting CPU and memory bandwidth harder than my standard desktop system here. Okay, so I think we got a handle on performance overall, but what about those 1060 Max-Q benchmarks? Well, here's the thing. I do have some data for comparison purposes, but one thing to bear in mind is that any laptop version of the Radeon Vega graphics in the NUC will be running at a 65 watt TDP or lower, not the 100 watt seen here. And that means a reduction in clocks and lower performance. Regardless, Max-Q is still faster, as you can see here in a rerun of the Assassin's Creed Unity test, where I've kept 1050 Ti desktop as a yardstick, but included both the standard mobile and Max-Q 1060s for comparison purposes. The gap closes because mobile 1060 performance is lower, but what we can't show you is how much lower the KB Lake G chipset would run with a lower TDP. Interesting thing here in Far Cry Primal though, you'll note that there's a fair bit of random stutter on the mobile 1060s here, and that's because not only is the mobile CPU weaker, the HP Omen laptops I was provided with for testing only had a single stick of RAM. Single channel DDR4 really isn't good for CPU performance and will cause this kind of stutter. Similar state of affairs in The Witcher 3 which really hammers memory bandwidth in our benchmark area. Lots of stutter that is more pronounced on the Nvidia side. Regardless though, the general trend is clear. KB Lake G has a ton going for it but comparisons with any GTX 1060 won't be flattering. So how about overclocking then? Well here we face issues with the thermal solution in the NUC which isn't exactly first class. At stock speeds the GPU stays pretty cool, hitting a max of around 75 Celsius, but a fully loaded CPU can move above 90 when all cores are maxed at 3.9 GHz. Overclocking headroom is therefore limited, but if you can put up with the noise of a tortured cooling assembly, I managed to get the HBM2 memory stable at 900 MHz with the core at around 1350. 
and this is what happens. First of all, Battlefield 1, a great performer at stock and the overclock gives us a nice 15% boost all around, which is pretty impressive. And that's almost matched by Crisis 3, which overall delivers a 14% boost. It's the same situation, the same increase with The Witcher 3, though the same stuttering remains in approximately the same locations. And finally, I thought I'd give the troublesome Assassin's Creed Origins a go, and well, as you can see, the booster performance here is almost negligible. Yeah, this is definitely an interesting benchmark I'm likely to look into a little bit further on down the line. Okay, so let's wrap this up. We've got a ton of processing power tucked away into a tiny box here. And the NUC will do the job for 1080p gameplay, no doubt about it. Battlefield 1 will lock to 1080p 60 or Ultra, but other less demanding titles will do the job too. While dropping settings on many other games will get you where you need to be without too much of a visual impact. Meanwhile, you get a nice, fast, 4-core, 8-thread i7 here, but the latest gaming laptops have moved on to 6 cores and 12 threads. I kind of feel that what we have here is a remarkable first effort, but a prospective second gen model with the latest CPU tech and a seven nanometer GPU will really show this concept at its absolute best. That said though, I mean, this is a box that's much tinier than the current gen consoles and it's packing a really nice size seven in here and around 3.65 teraflops of GPU power. I mean, that's not to be sniffed at, is it? Now here's the thing though, it is pricey at $1,000 and that's just for the NUC itself. It doesn't come with memory or storage. You'll need to provide those. But this uh, PC market is all about exploring the niches and prices do come down eventually. And we need trailblazing projects like this to set the direction for innovation to come. Okay, so that's where I'm going to leave things for now. Please do like, subscribe and share to support this kind of analysis work. And yes, please do check out the Digital Foundry Patreon for pristine quality downloads of everything we do. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching.